Welcome to the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, a nonprofit organization with the mission and vision of furthering both education and research in the field of oral implantology. My name is Dr. Waji Khan. I am a dental surgeon and also the course director for a series of online lectures provided as a service to the profession of dentistry to deliver a literature and knowledge-based approach to dental implant education for practitioners interested in learning more about how to implement the discipline of oral implantology into their clinical practice. This online course should be merged with a suitable clinical course and long-term mentorship study club program so that the learner can maximize their benefit from the didactic online program. The production of this series of lectures was partially funded by an educational grant from the International Dental Implant Academy. Lecture 20, Preventing Medical Emergencies. So going back to lecture 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, prior to getting to the surgical phase, we, we emphasized the importance of taking appropriate medical histories on patients and uh, providing patients with the appropriate uh, physical exams and getting proper tests and consults conducted prior to engaging in surgical treatment. Even with this in hand, we are not immune to rare or even uh, the, uh, the small percentage likelihoods that medical emergencies will occur inside our office. As such, it behooves us as professionals to practice, practice, practice methods and have systems in place in our office with our staff. These systems are not just in terms of how to provide basic cardiac life support and simple things like first aid, but also in terms of communicating and people being aware of their roles and responsibilities should something occur. We try not to work in a silo of a system. Uh, we are masters of providing dental care. We are not masters of running an emergency room in our dental office. As such, many times these subjects can be very uncomfortable, not only for the dentist, but also uh, for the staff, as these are not things that they're very familiar with, and it can lead to uh, feelings of discomfort. As such, uh, practice, practice, practice is going to sort of help uh, eliminate some of these discomforts and also uh, facilitate uh, a, better, a better outcome for the patient. So let's take a look at the types of emergencies that occur in the dental office. So this was previously reported uh, in the past. Uh, I've reported 30,608 cases. There were basically 15,407 ca reported cases of syncope or patient just fainting. Uh, there were 2,583 cases of mild allergy, 2,552 cases of angina or chest pain, 2,475 cases of postural hypotension, 1,595 cases of seizure, 1,392 cases of bronchospasm, 1,326 cases of hyperventilation, 913 reported cases of an epinephrine reaction, 890 reported cases of hypoglycemia or insulin shock, uh, 331 cases of cardiac arrest, 304 cases of anaphylaxis, 289 cases of myocardial infarction, 204 cases of local anesthetic overdose, 141 cases of acute pulmonary edema, heart failure, diabetic coma of reported cases of 109, and 68 reported cases of a cerebrovascular accident, and 25 cases of adrenal insufficiency, and four of a thyroid storm. So what we want to summarize here is that you'll notice that there's a differentiation between cases on the left and cases on the right. So 95% of the 30,608 cases that were reported uh, were of, of a nature where there, it would be something which we could do something for the patient inside the office and the likelihood of there being an adverse outcome was low. Uh, and in 5% of cases, uh, these were more difficult things to deal with and more difficult in terms of there likely being a, a, a potential uh, for a negative outcome. Uh, this data was reported by uh, Dr. Ellis in 1986 and from Dr. Malamed in 1993. So what will kill someone in the dental office? 
So we talk about five things here. We talk about cardiovascular issues. We talk about respiratory issues. We talk about anaphylaxis. We talk about bleeding. And we talk about neurological disorders. So the summary, we can reliably screen for these. Uh, as going, going back to the previous slide, you notice that there was about 5% of cases where, unfortunately, despite screening, uh, uh, there were some reported cases. Uh, what, I will, what I will add here is that the, the issue with screening is that if you screen a patient, you can have a plan in place. And at least if you have a plan in place, you know that there's something that you can do for someone or you, your index of uh, suspicion uh, or in terms of uh, having additional consults, having additional, uh, uh, additional adjuncts during your procedure, having uh, different monitors available during the procedure. Uh, these can help to help either uh, screen for these uh, uh, screen for the incidence of these situations occurring earlier uh, so that one can intervene and perhaps uh, provide the patient with a more positive outcome. So the agenda today is what we're going to talk about are a number of things. Basically we're going to talk about screening. Uh, screening basically once again goes back to uh, review, review, review of that medical history and the items that we talked about in the earlier lectures. Uh, number two we're going to talk about handling some medical emergencies. Uh, number three, we're going to talk about communication. And, and lastly, we're going to talk about steps forward. So the medical history form, this is once again that basic medical history form that we give patients uh, at our front desks. And this is whether they're coming in for bilateral sinus lifts, on lay bone grafting, and you know, tendental implants, or they're coming to our office uh, just to have a routine uh, checkup and hygiene appointment. Sometimes we have to stress the importance to our patients for why we're asking all of these questions. Uh, many times patients, uh, when they're coming to the dental office, they think that all we work on is just teeth, and that's all we do. They don't realize that we are healthcare practitioners, and that should there be a case that they have something in their medical history that can lead to uh, some sort of a medical emergency in the dental office, we need to be aware of what those uh, items in the medical history may be so that we can plan for this. So this is also a history and physical examination form from a local hospital. Uh, you'll notice that the form is a little bit shorter. Uh, however, it does sort of highlight in a nice, structured, systematic manner uh, in which uh, man manner in which we should try to review some of the things for patients in terms of not only the medical history as a screening tool, but also using that screening tool for a review of systems uh, that can guide a physical exam for the patient as well. So we talk about the ASA classification system again. So this is the American Society of Anesthesiology Physical Status Classification System. And in this, we define a patient as ASA1, as a normal, healthy patient, ASA2, a patient with mild systemic disease, ASA3, a patient with severe systemic disease that limits activity but is not incapacitating. ASA4, a patient with incapacitating systemic disease that is a constant threat to life. ASA5, a moribund patient not expected to survive 24 hours with or without operation. ASA6, a declared brain dead patient whose organs are being removed for donor purposes and ASAE, basically an emergency operation of any variety where E precedes the number for the ASA classification indicating the patient's physical status. So the summary of the ASA classification system, or at least the point that should, we, should be made for us, is that one and two are going to be straightforward for us. There's no, a very low likelihood of there being some issue inside the office, whereas three and four may warrant further consultation with the patient's physician in terms of getting blood work, getting electrocardiogram, in terms of getting a chest x-ray for the patient. So we're going to talk about cardiovascular. So basically, we're talking about the myocardial infarction, heart failure, cerebrovascular accidents, bleeding. Uh, these are things that we need to screen for and we need to ask patients. So uh, we, uh, we need to ask the patient for a complete list of drugs that they're on and try to relate these uh, medications to the patient's condition. The most important thing for any patient who has a cardiovascular history is to ask, uh, find out if they're, if they're stable. Um, so in, in our office we have these medical history forms that are screening forms and as, as I sort of alluded to by showing you the hospital's uh, uh, history and physical form. Uh, 
you need to basically use your medical history form as a screening tool, but then beyond that, sort of view your medical history form as not just a static document, but a dynamic uh, artifact uh, to in which you need to ask further questions or the review of systems that we always refer to. And as I mentioned, the most important thing for patients who are uh, have a cardiovascular issue is, is this patient stable? This sort of applies to any medical condition, but what do you want to ask this patient? So in our office, we always ask patients, okay, can you walk up a flight of stairs or can you walk two city blocks? And if it's the case that they can do this, this is actually a very good prognostic indicator that this patient has a stable cardiovascular state. Uh, that basically, these activities represent three metabolic equivalents, and you're putting a fair amount of cardiovascular stress by uh, being able to walk a flight of stairs or walking two city blocks. So if they tell me they can do that, I'm comfortable. If they tell me that they, it took them about 30 minutes to walk up a flight of stairs and that they can barely walk a city block, I become a little bit more concerned about whether I want to operate on this patient in a routine clinic uh, uh, community-based uh, dental practice. Respiratory. So you want to determine if the patient has control over their condition, uh, both acutely and chronically. So the big ones that we're sort of going to look at are asthma and COPD. So in terms of asthma, we routinely ask patients uh, how often they take their uh, beta-2 agonist or the reliever drug. Not the steroid, which many patients take every day, uh, but the reliever. So if they're taking it more than two or three times a week, uh, that usually doesn't really imply that they have uh, as an asthmatic condition that is controlled. And you may want to refer them back to their primary care physician or to their respirologist in order to figure out what, what's really going on in their case. Uh, the absence of wheezing is usually not a good prognostic indicator that a patient has uh, control over their airway. Uh, peak flow meters are much better to sort of determine uh, if a patient has uh, a patent airway. Uh, we'll show a picture of peak flow meters uh, in a little bit. You can also perform auscultation of the lungs. Uh, we have a little video included uh, as part of this presentation. It's been taken off of YouTube, and uh, it'll basically demonstrate uh, proper technique for auscultation of the lungs. So if it's the case that a patient, uh, uh, you need to auscultate a patient, this sort of gives you a picture or a diagram of the, uh, of the lobes of the, of the lung. You'll notice that the lung on the right side, uh, the, right, uh, the, right, uh, the right lung, that there's three lobes. There's the right upper, right mid middle, and the right lower. And on the left side, you have the left upper and the left lower. Uh, so it's important to note that the, the, you can basically hear all the lobes of the lung from the back. However, in order to hear the right middle lobe, one needs to auscultate uh, the pa that, that lobe or the patient uh, from the anterior. Uh, the other important things to note here that if it's the case that a patient aspirates an item inside the office, it's more likely going to be located in the right main stem bronchus. It's going to go on the right, so that's probably where you want to go first. And the last thing I'm going to point out here is if it's the case that you want the best sensitivity and specificity to determine whether a patient has something like, for example, a pneumonia, it's best to go to the axilla and try to auscultate uh, the right lower lobe and the left lower lobe. And I'm just going to uh, summarize here, uh, or sorry, reiterate the point that if a patient aspirates an implant component, you'll see from this uh, picture here that shows uh, the tree uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the lung, that the uh, right main stem bronchus uh, it has a bit of a more downward angle as compared to the left. So if someone's going to aspirate something, if you had to bet the money, uh, more than likely it went down the right. Lung auscultation. When auscultating the posterior chest, ask your patient to bend her head forward and fold her arms in front. This will move the scapula laterally and bring you closer to the chest wall. Lung auscultation should always be performed with the stethoscope on bare skin. Ask the patient to breathe deeply in and out through their mouth to eliminate sinus sounds. Listen fully through both inhalation and exhalation. Always listen systematically from side to side in a minimum of 10 points, at least four in the front, four in the back, and two in the axilla for the right middle lobe and the lingula. When auscultating the anterior chest, have the patient sit upright. If necessary, you may ask your patient to lift her breast to facilitate auscultation.
anaphylaxis. So when it comes to anaphylaxis, we need to determine what allergies a patient may truly have. And when it comes to asking the question what allergies a patient may truly have, we need to determine what the exact nature of the allergy is. And if you're in doubt, there's nothing wrong with writing a quick note to the patient's physician or their allergy and immunology specialist to get a professional opinion on how to manage it. And the main reason we want to do this is you need to determine if the allergy the patient has actually is an allergy or if this is actually just a side effect or one of the you know, un, un, unfriendly complications of having to take that particular medicine. The number one, uh, one we get in our office is people come into the office saying that they have a reported allergy to penicillin. Now, this isn't that big a deal. There's other antibiotics that are available. However, we know that penicillin is naturally occurring. It's secreted unchanged, and that it works very, very well for the polymicrobial infections that occur inside the mouth. And many times when I ask patients, uh, why are you allergic to penicillin? What happens when you take penicillin? Patients will say that it gave them diarrhea or if it gave them uh, a mild rash. Uh, so in these sorts of circumstances, there's nothing wrong with writing that quick note to the physician to get a professional opinion on how to manage the patient's condition. Because even giving a patient a substitute medication like, say, one of the macrolide medications or uh, lincosamide medications like clindamycin, there's nothing wrong with giving them those medications. However, why wouldn't we want to give patients the gold standard uh, for treatment of polymicrobial infections inside the mouth, that being penicillin? Bleeding. Bleeding seems to be a no-brainer, but you only make this mistake once. Uh, as I would mentioned in previous lectures, I'm always more confident in working on a patient when I ask them in their history and physical, tell me about your surgical history. And they tell me that they've had wisdom teeth taken out, they had a gallbladder removed, they had a hysterectomy, and that there was no bleeding concerns. What scares me to death is when patients come to me and say, I've never had any surgical procedure done before. And as previously mentioned, this is where the weird and wonderful bleeding disorders will come and, come and uh, you know, present themselves inside the office. The, the first incidence of problems with clotting disorders uh, has been reported to be when people go to have their wisdom teeth taken out. Other questions you need to ask patients about are the five A's. The use of alcohol, the use of anticoagulants, the use of antineoplastics or cancer medications, the use of antibiotics. As we know, antibiotics can basically rid the gut of bacteria. Many times these bacteria are required for the, for the production of vitamin K dependent clotting factors. Uh, aspirin. So how do we treat bleeding? So we treat bleeding by either crushing, burnishing, putting pressure on, elevation, using bone wax, things like gel foam, microfibrillar collagen, or oxidized cellulose. Uh, in terms of patients who we may have a suspicion that there may be a bleeding disorder, these are the things you need to ask for. You need to ask for a bleeding uh, workup. That will include a complete blood count, a blood smear, a PT, PTT, an INR, a bleeding time, uh, electrophoresis, retic count, bilirubin, haptoglobin, ferritin, and a Coombs. Neurological disorders. Practice emergencies in your office at least once a year. We mentioned that at the beginning of this lecture. This is also a great staff building opportunity and allows you to identify gaps that exist in your systems. If you have not seen a seizure in your office yet, you have not been practicing long enough. So psychiatric issues. Psychiatric issues is, is one of those things that we just don't know uh, what is out there. I can tell you from my own time working in the psychiatric department is that not, not most people that have psychiatric problems aren't locked up in hospitals. The goal of treatment for these people is to try to get them out into the community. And as such, there are a lot of people, unfortunately, who have diagnosed and undiagnosed psychiatric issues that are walking the streets. Uh, many times uh, you'll be walking down the street and someone will cut you off in your car and they'll just start yelling at you and you don't quite understand why they were yelling at you. Well, what I'm going to allude to here is that many different types of people come in our office. People come from all walks of life and that psychiatric issues can end up you know, playing 
a role in treatment outcomes or at least things occurring inside the office. So if it's the case that one has some concerns about a patient, it, there may, there, it, obviously it's not a practice builder to tell a patient you think they have a psychiatric issue. However, you can always lead in with open questions and ask them and say, how are things in life? How are things at home? How are things at work? And if it's the case that you have some concerns about the stability of an individual, you may want to either A, choose not to operate on them, or B, uh, refer them to the primary care physician and express your concerns. So when do emergencies occur? So basically immediately before treatment, during or after local anesthetic, during treatment, after treatment, after leaving the office. So this is from Mastura uh, in 1990. And we've highlighted in red here, during or after local anesthetic or during treatment. You'll refer back to that study uh, that we had put at the beginning of this presentation of 30,000 reported cases. You'll notice that almost half of them were the patient just fainting. And that will account for some of these numbers that you see uh, in, the, uh, in the percentages of when emergencies occur. As such, if you see the 54.9% during or after local anesthetic, that's perhaps the time that you want to really sort of keep an eye on things and make sure things are going well. And be, be somewhat uh, astute about uh, not just talking to your patient, but taking a look at, for things that what they refer to as extra lexical cues. So look at their eyebrows, look at their foreheads, look at their lips, look at the position of their hands and their feet. Handling emergencies. So we talk about practice, practice, practice. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. There's nothing wrong with feeling uncomfortable. We're not running an ER in our dental office. So when these things occur, uh, you can definitely, you can definitely, it's, it's okay to feel uncomfortable. That's what I tell my staff. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. Everybody calm down. Everybody slow down. Take a, take a deep breath and let's, let's deal with this. So the basic kit for handling emergencies that I recommend in most dental offices, and if you're, you know, if you're performing uh, oral surgical procedures or performing implant surgery, you may want to add a few other things on. So an oxygen E-sized cylinder with a non-rebreather mask and also with appropriate ambu bags. Uh, there's a pediatric, uh, a, uh, a young adult, and an adult size. There's also epinephrine in the form of EpiPens and also just the standard ampule. Uh, the EpiPen, just to note, is 0.3 milligrams, and sometimes in some emergencies you require up to one milligram. Uh, then there's the Ventolent metered dose inhaler with the aero chamber. We then recommend you put some diphenhydramine uh, inside your kits. Also have sugar and a glucometer. So patients that come in, they rush into the office, they they have diabetes, they took their insulin, they were trying to you know, not get yelled at by your uh, front desk staff for being late again, and they didn't eat. And so they have their insulin on board, which is basically taking a lot of their uh, sh sugar inside the blood, uh, the glucose inside the blood, and basically putting it, you know, storing it away. And the problem with these cases is that you know, these patients actually need that glucose. So if it's the case that they don't have uh, this inside the blood, or they didn't take the oral car carbohydrate, uh, that these patients are going to be having some issues inside your office. We talk about the use of nitroglycerin or nitrolingual, 325 milligrams of aspirin, and then we talk about other things. So here's a picture of a standard uh, cylinder of oxygen with, a, uh, with a, a, a regulator on it. You want to make sure that the regulator, when you turn it on and test it, goes up to 2,000 PSI, which indicates that this is a full tank. If it's the case that you end up using it, you may want to end up using this tank if you perform nit nitrous oxide and oxygen constant sedation in your office, use it for something like that, or, uh, and just uh, get a new tank, uh, as there is a time limit in terms of how much oxygen can be provided from this. Uh, a picture on the left basically shows a non-rebreather mask. In a typical emergency we want to go up to at least 15 liters a minute with the non-rebreather mask in order to provide the patient the conscious patient who's breathing with a source of 100 percent oxygen in terms of airway management we also recommend a various uh, combination of sizes of uh, goodell airways pictures on the left and also of a, a pocket mask uh, or a, a mask with a uh, one-way valve uh, that one can use to get uh, a proper seal on the patient should you be required to use the ambu bag. And here's the ambu bag or the bag valve mask uh, photograph of that. Uh, there will be a demonstration and a video of how to use this. Finally, in terms of airway management, uh, 
despite the fact that we're not running an operating room or an ER in our office, it does behoove you if you are doing forms of sedation inside your office to have means by which to achieve endotracheal intubation uh, should there be uh, a severe airway emergency. And lastly, uh, just in terms of keeping the airway clean, uh, we talk about airway suction. So this is a Yankauer suction. Uh, and there's also a portable battery-operated suction unit, should it be the case that you have an airway emergency that occurs inside your office, and ironically, stroke of bad luck, the power goes at the same time, and your suction capabilities at your office are gone. It, for the couple hundred bucks it costs to have this thing, this thing uh, can be not only provide you with peace of mind, but can be a lifesaver. And a cricothyrotomy kit. Uh, basically is a last-ditch effort. Uh, once again, we're not ENT surgeons. We're not going to do a tracheostomy inside the patient. These uh, disposable cricothyrotomy kits are excellent uh, as a means by uh, which to get an airway prior to getting the patient to the appropriate uh, healthcare practitioners to get a, a more uh, definitive surgical airway. This video will explain how to safely manage an airway and ventilate a patient using the following adjuncts Goodell oropharyngeal airway, nasopharyngeal airway and bag valve mask. Adjuncts are required when the patient cannot protect their own airway, the danger being the tongue falling back to displace the epiglottis and obstruct the passage of air in and out of the lungs. This most commonly occurs in unconscious patients as muscle tone is lost and the gag reflex is absent. In the following scenarios, the patient is in varying degrees of consciousness and is not adequately ventilating. Basic airway manoeuvres such as chin lift and jaw thrust have failed. An oropharyngeal airway is indicated only for unconscious patients because inserting this type of airway when the gag reflex is intact might lead to vomiting and aspiration. First open the mouth and inspect to assess whether an oropharyngeal airway is viable. Use suction if required. The Goodell is a hollow tube with a tip at one end and a flange at the other. The body is semicircular in shape to follow the curvature of the palate. The correct sizing of the Goodell is important both for safety and to maximise its efficacy. The Goodell is sized from the incisors of the mouth to the tragus of the ear. Approach the patient's head from behind the bed. Open the mouth and insert the Goodell upside down with the tip pointing upwards. When you feel the tip touching the back of the throat, rotate the Goodell 180 degrees to leave it in the correct position. Inserting the Goodell upside down like this may feel counterintuitive, but is done this way as the inverted curved body presses the tongue down to stop it falling back and obstructing the airway. In children, however, the Goodell is inserted the right way up to avoid trauma to soft tissues. If the patient starts to gag upon insertion, remove the Goodell and check the size is correct, then re-attempt insertion. If it is still not possible, consider abandoning the procedure and returning to manual airway manoeuvres. Once in situ, the Goodell should remain there of its own accord. Do not secure it with tape in case the patient starts to gag or cough, in which case they may aspirate because they cannot expel the device. Nasopharyngeal airway adjuncts are indicated in unconscious patients. Unlike the Goodell though, they have use in semi-conscious because they are less likely to stimulate the gag reflex. They may also be used in patients who do not require assistance for ventilation, but in whom you still wish to maximise the airway patency. In some situations, such as if the patient has trismus, or maxillofacial injuries present, nasopharyngeal airways may be the only way to establish a patent airway. First check that the nasal passages are viable. If there is any indication of basal skull fracture, then do not attempt a nasopharyngeal airway due to the risk of inserting it through a possible cribriform plate fracture and injuring the brain. The nasopharyngeal airway has a beveled tip and flange end. Sizing of the nasopharyngeal airway is again important. Correct sizing can be ascertained by matching the diameter of the nasopharyngeal airway to the diameter of the patient's little finger. As a rough estimate, 
the airway size sele selected should also correspond to the distance between the patient's nostril and the meatus of the ear. Before insertion, apply a water-based lubricating gel onto the nasopharyngeal adjunct. Approach the patient's head from behind the bed. With the beveled end, insert the airway through the most patent nostril. Push posteriorly so that the airway moves backwards along the horizontal floor of the hard palate and not upwards into the cribriform plate. A slight twisting motion may help push the airway in. Keep going until the flange end is at the nostril. This means the airway is into the posterior pharynx. If there is too much resistance, pull out and try the other nostril. Once in place, the flange will stop inhalation, but tape may be used to secure. Both nostrils can have a nasopharyngeal airway inserted to further increase the patency of the airway. The bag valve mask allows positive airway pressure to be applied to any patient that is not ventilating properly. Most obviously, this may be if they are apneic, also, if their respiratory rate is too slow or too fast to provide an adequate tidal volume. The device consists of three parts. The bag is a self-inflating air chamber and can be fitted to an oxygen reservoir to supply supplementary oxygen to the patient. The bag is connected by a tube to an oxygen flow meter at the wall or to a cylinder. The valve acts one way allowing air from the bag to flow into the patient's lungs, preventing deoxygenated air returning to the bag in expiration. The mask delivers air to the airway by forming a tight seal around the patient's nose and mouth. Correct sizing is critical to ensure this seal and should be done by placing the mask over the patient's nose and mouth so that they are covered. The mask is too big if it extends over the chin. Ventilation with the bag valve mask is only effective if there is a patent airway. So first check the airway and use adjuncts if necessary. Application of the bag valve mask is always a two person technique with one person controlling the mask and the other person controlling the bag. The first clinician should approach the patient's head from behind the bed and place the mask over the patient's nose and mouth. Two opposing C-shapes should be formed by the thumb and index fingers and downward pressure applied to form a tight seal. Wrap the remaining fingers around the jaw and pull upwards to help open the airway further. Avoid putting too much downward pressure on the mask as you may inadvertently flex the head forward and reduce the size of the airway. An alternative grip is to apply downward pressure on the mask with just the thumbs using the thenar eminences to stabilize the mask in place and the fingers to pull the jaw upwards. The second clinician should squeeze the bag fully every five seconds to achieve a respiratory rate of 12 breaths per minute. If the bag valve mask ventilation is successful, breath mist should appear on the mask and the chest will be seen to rise as the bag is squeezed. Patient monitoring equipment will show a decrease in the end tidal CO2 and an improvement in the oxygen saturations. The commonest reason for failure of bag valve ventilation is a poor seal between the airway and the mask. If signs of ventilation are not seen, reevaluate the seal. If you need to administer an EpiPen for yourself or others, it's easy to use in two simple steps. If there's an emergency, these two simple steps could save your life or someone else's. Hold the ergonomically designed EpiPen in your hand and one, 
pull off the blue safety release, which will unlock the device. Now the EpiPen Auto Injector is ready to use. A clear window shows if the EpiPen has already been used. If the clear window is obstructed in any way, or if the device does not fit into the carrier, it should not be used. 2. Place the orange end of the EpiPen against the outer mid thigh and push firmly into the thigh so it clicks. Hold it there for approximately 10 seconds to make sure all the medicine is delivered. Seek emergency medical attention right away. Take the EpiPen auto injector with you to the hospital emergency department. There is no need for concern about an exposed needle since it is protected both before and after use. You'll also find easy to read instructions printed on the EpiPen auto injector. It's as simple as one, two. Remember these two simple steps and always keep your EpiPen auto injector close at hand to stay prepared. So we snuck in there a presentation about EpiPens and how to use the EpiPen. Uh, now we're going to talk about the, the Ventolin meter dose inhaler with the aero chamber. Now if you don't have the aero chamber, it's not a big deal. Usually patients who have uh, respiratory issues, we tell them to bring their Ventolin or their Beta-2 agonist or their reliever uh, with them and usually we place this on the bracket table or on the table or on the table beside you uh, in case it's required. Uh, as many times patients also who don't have good control of their of their airway we ask them to take a Ventolin prior to the procedure just so that things like anxiety uh, can you know don't necessarily precipitate a uh, an airway emergency. The purpose of the airway chamber is basically give some distance uh, to allow these particles uh, from the meter dose inhaler to become smaller uh, to get into the more distal aspects of the lung. Peak flow meters as we referred to earlier are a little bit better in terms of determining the level of airway control that a patient actually has. So we mentioned that the absence of wheezing in a patient or a patient who has asthma is not necessarily a sign or it actually gets to the point where it's a bad sign uh, that this is not a patient that you should be working on today. Peak flow meter gives you sort of a better idea of how this patient is able to breathe and whether this is a patient who you should be working on today. Diphenhydramine is also an excellent uh, item to have inside the office, uh, either the uh, IV IM version uh, of 50 milligrams per milliliter, usually we give patients 50 milligram, or the oral version. A glucometer and a glucose source. So. Uh, you can get any sort of glucometer with the relative reading strips and the, uh, the, the needle that's required to actually harvest a drop of blood from the patient's uh, fingertip uh, and also Insta-Glucose. Uh, inside the office, sometimes uh, people recommend, oh, you just put like icing sugar or have a can of Coke or, uh, you know, I, one office I went to, uh, their source of sugar was Coke Zero. And, I sort of chuckled. I said, Coke, zero. Guys, there's zero calories, meaning zero glucose. This is not going to work really well. So uh, the insta-glucose is a little bit better in terms of uh, just being something which is easier to um, uh, administer to a patient. Uh, you know, patients who, are, who, who, who have a, uh, a, a hypoglycemic emergency, uh, you know, they're not really sitting there looking to t put down volumes and volumes uh, of, of, of oral carbohydrates. So in this sense, something like the insta-glucose uh, is a little bit better to have. Nitroglycerin or nitrolingual, aspirin, and other things like IV fluids. So you can have either D5W or lactated ringers. Either source is going to provide the patient uh, with fluid. 
Decadron, dexamethasone. So basically, this is a corticosteroid. Uh, usually, uh, in patients who we operate on, we'll give them, uh, if we have an IV source, 8 milligrams of Decadron. Benzodiazepines for uh, sedation, uh, if you have an appropriate sedation permit in your office. Uh, midazolam, uh, 2 to, two to uh, 4 milligrams uh, is excellent for anxiolysis in patients. If one's going to be having benzodiazepines, even the oral benzodiazepines uh, like Ativan or Trazolam, uh, it behooves one to sort of have the reversal agent available, that being flumazenil. Uh, it's important to note that if one is using flumazenil, that the half-life of flumazenil is usually half of that of the uh, benzodiazepine. And as such, uh, it has it, when, you, when you give it to a patient in an IV, it has a rapid awakening effect. There's a rapid reversal of the benzodiazepine. However, because the half-life is a lot shorter, uh, there can be what they refer to as the resedation effect. Vital signs monitors. Now, these can be affordably purchased from a variety of sources. Uh, even in patients who are just doing mild sedation or nitrous oxide on, uh, will routinely clip a vital signs monitor on. Uh, there's many, uh, many things that you can sort of see from a patient. Uh, one would be the blood pressure of the patient. Number two would be their pulse oximetry. Uh, number, uh, number three would be their, uh, their pulse. And finally, many of these things have temperature probes on them as well. Not that temperature really is going to be a factor uh, in the sort of the operating room setting that we're working in. However, it is a capability that's available on these things should it be the case that one wants to take a temperature of a patient and to rule out that the patient has a has a fever and that this is a patient that should not be operated on today. A stethoscope. Uh, I've seen many varieties of stethoscopes on the market. I personally like the Littman Cardiology 2. Uh, I'm not paid by Littman to say this. It's just a good stethoscope with uh, excellent earpieces and it really allows you to hear things a lot clearer than sort of the Mickey Mouse stethoscopes that can be purchased uh, quite uh, affordably in, from other sources. A nice blood pressure cuff. Uh, what I like about these Welch Allen blood pressure cuffs is that the actual uh, the actual bulb to inflate the uh, blood pressure cuff and the actual uh, gauge that reads the pressure are all included as one piece. It's easy to use. It's easy to package. It's easy to just sort of tuck away. You can also use your vital signs monitor, but nothing beats having the ability to take a manual blood pressure on a patient. AEDs or automated external defibrillators. Uh, these used to be commonly found in just sports facilities and in casinos. Uh, nowadays, you can find AEDs pretty much in any public venue. And as such, uh, you have, having an AED at the dental office is not, ne not necessarily uh, a bad idea. Uh, we have two in our office, one located at one on each side. Uh, in, in terms of cost, these can be affordably purchased for just, just around $1,000. Uh, they have uh, disposable batteries inside them. These batteries need to be checked routinely. Uh, you also need to make sure that you inform your staff of where these AEDs are. You'll notice a picture on the right. There's also a sign. These can be purchased uh, from a company. Uh, we purchased ours from one called Global Industrial. Uh, these signs basically highlight that where the AED is and that it's not just a box on the wall. Other tips for, for you are to maintain your first aid qualifications uh, in terms of understanding the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. Maintain your CPR. Renew your CPR every year. Even though many times when you take your CPR course, uh, they tell you that you know, it's good for two or three years. Uh, for, for the, for the uh, few hours that it takes and for the, uh, for the cost, uh, it really behooves you to maintain your CPR just because if you don't practice it, practice, practice, practice every day, you're going to forget it. And should it be the case that you're required to, to use this in the office uh, or even in a public setting, um, uh, so, like somewhere else, like at a park or uh, at, a, uh, at a public venue, uh, you will feel a lot better having reviewed or renewed this course every year. I've been personally taking CPR since 1987. Also, uh, even though it's not required to, uh, to pr practice dentistry, there's a course called Advanced Cardiac Life Support. And if you've never taken it, uh, you may want to take it. It's a good course. It's an eye-opener. And it really teaches you a lot of extra things, which hopefully you, you know, don't need to use in the dental office because you reviewed, reviewed, reviewed your medical histories and you screened, screened, screened for bad things that are going to happen. But nonetheless, uh, if should things happen, you'll feel a lot more confident having had a little bit more training. 
communication is also a very important thing. So when bad things happen inside the office, what do you do? So the ambulance comes, they pick somebody up, they take them to the hospital. Okay, perfect. My job's done. No, your job is not done. It's very important to not only communicate everything to the uh, first line responders, that being the paramedics, uh, the EMTs that sort of come to your office to take this patient to the next level, but to also give your colleagues at the hospital a call and let them know what's going on. So if a patient comes to your office and they have a, a, a seizure and this end up be, ends up being one of those uh, one of those seizures that just you know lasts a long time and you know you you just can't you just can't do anything about even after administering a a, a, a benzodiazepine, you perhaps want to give the emergency room physician a call. Let them know what you administer, what type of uh, local anesthetic uh, you administered, the quantity, uh, some of the other pertinent details around history. This is a photograph of a patient. This was, wasn't my patient, but this was a patient that came to see me uh, in a facility that I was working in because the patient had been referred off to have some teeth taken out. And basically, the patient was brought back to the facility, and the patient's complaint to me was that he couldn't close his jaw and that it really hurt at the angle of his mandible. And as you can see, this patient had a mandibular fracture from the removal of these teeth, and there's still a piece of tooth left inside here. And uh, unfortunately, the, the individual who had performed the procedure didn't uh, claims to have not have noticed that this happened, but also, uh, you know, even if the person did, fail to call uh, in order to ensure that this, there would be continuity of care or appropriate continuity of care. Uh, many times uh, when I myself have worked in a hospital, one time I was working uh, with a colleague of mine, he's a, he's a radiologist, and uh, he received a, a, a requ requisition from uh, from a physician and, and the requisition said CT head and neck and he, he basically looked at me and said CT head and neck that's it like you want me to take what, what is this where's Waldo uh, am I supposed to sort of figure out what's going on here why are you ordering this CT head and neck so unlike unlike uh, veterinarians who get patients that being uh, animals where the animals can't communicate with them uh, and they have to sort of uh, play this game of uh, being a Jedi Knight and trying to figure out what's going on, we don't, we have the luxury of being able to uh, be able to think, uh, be able to speak, and be able to communicate with our colleagues. So it's very important to make sure that we call our colleagues for a proper handover to ensure that appropriate tidbits of information are passed along, so that the outcome for the patient can be best, and that uh, you know we ensure that we're not just sort of like throwing a football or a blind pass to our colleagues and asking them to take the hit for us. So call your colleagues. Give them a heads up. They are colleagues. So steps forward. So this is basically the last formal lecture inside this lecture series. And what we're going to tell people uh, in terms of where to go from here. Well, sorry, let me, let me just uh, uh, go from step forward for the medical emergencies uh, aspect, which is number one, test your office ability to deal with emergencies. Number two, change your medical screening methods. So use your medical history forms as a screening tool and then sort of have other methods available to make these medical history forms a dynamic uh, artifact and have appropriate, ask appropriate questions of your patients, ask appropriate reviews of systems, uh, seek appropriate consultations where required. Maintain an up-to-date emergency kit. One of the things I didn't highlight when we were talking about uh, things to include inside your emergency kit is that emergency, a lot of the emergency drugs, they have expiry dates. Now, there's some excellent companies out there that will provide you with your emergency drugs and will actually monitor the expiry dates for you and reissue to you uh, a new drug as soon as it becomes available. Uh, one of these companies in Canada is is Hansamed. Uh, in the United States or in other parts of the world, I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, you can also uh, basically just buy new ones every year. Most of these have a shelf life of at least a year. One of the dental societies that I belong to, uh, they actually, uh, as part of their annual meeting, provide you uh, with a new emergency drug kit or new new drugs to replace uh, the old ones that have expired. Uh, number four, develop good working relationships with your other colleagues should it be the case that you need to communicate with them. Number five, invite your colleagues to your practice. So a summary. So the summary here is screening for common things. Number two, we talked about handling emergencies. Number three, we talked about communication. Number four, we talked about steps forward. So next for training. So this, I started a bit about this a little bit earlier. Uh, this is basically the last lecture in this online series of lectures provided for this online didactic implant training course. The next for training is review the presentations. 
Number two, take the week-long intensive hands-on surgical placement course. Some people say that you know you should take a course. It's like the weekend warrior course. We take like 20 or 30 weekends and uh, you know piece them together. Uh, myself personally, uh, playing being a guitar player, I'll tell you this: that if I take a guitar lesson from my guitar instructor and I go back a month later, I pretty much have forgotten almost everything I learned in that first lesson. So when I take guitar lessons, I'll usually take two or three in a row so that I can go back home and hammer away the things that I learned. As such, uh, you need to immerse yourself in the placement of dental implants. And my own personal bias is that I think that taking a, a week-long or two-week-long intensive course where all you're doing is living, breathing, sleeping, eating uh, implants is the way to go and that you'll learn a lot more from this and that you'll also be able to take this uh, forward into your practice. And even if, it, if it's a month later that you don't place an, it's not a month, not till a month later that you get to place an implant, that you'll still have uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, tacit skill, that muscle memory, uh, that uh, the, the memories of how actually having uh, taken an intensive course as opposed to have just gone in for a one day or a weekend seminar and uh, or a bunch of weekend seminars pieced together and try to bridge those together as a form of education and be able to provide a meaningful outcome. Join a study club and or mentorship group. Uh, there's lots of great study clubs out there. There's lots of great mentorship groups out there. Uh, even if it's not a ma matter of getting into a mentorship group, find yourself a mentor. So I've once again included the references that we used in the production of this lecture series. On behalf of the entire team at the Cataraqui Woods Dental Implant Institute, I want to thank you for participating in our online lecture series and wish you the best of luck in your career in implant dentistry.